Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What are you waiting for? Well, what are you waiting for? A question maybe you've heard before or you've asked somebody. And it could mean many things. But today we're going to look at the root of the desire behind the question, what are you waiting for? And another question, what are you looking for? See, our gospel reading today is full of questions. It's full of questions of John and his disciples asking Jesus, are you the one that we've been waiting for or should we continue to wait for somebody else? And then Jesus, after they leave, starts asking the crowd a bunch of questions about themselves concerning John the Baptist. What were you looking for when you went out to listen to him? Well, we're going to look at the text to see what answers are given to these questions. After all, that's why we ask questions. We want an answer. We want to know we want the mystery to be revealed. So as we go through the text this morning, consider these two questions that I put to you now. What are you waiting for? And what are you looking for? So in our gospel reading today, it starts with the question, are you the one? Are you the one that was promised? Are you the one that we were waiting for? Or shall we wait for another. And really, that simple question carries with it so much weight of the history of God's people. And we know this from God's word itself. For the answer to this question, or rather the first time this question was sort of posed, is all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. That's the first time that God promises that he is going to send the one, the chosen one, the Savior, the Messiah, to rescue his people. And here we are so many centuries later and someone is now asking that question of Jesus. Are you the one we are waiting for? The one prophesied throughout the entire Old Testament, the fulfillment of the law of God the one who has come to deliver us. It's not such a small question anymore, is it? Are you the one? Because if the answer is yes, quite simply, the world changes. If the answer to this question is yes, the world will never be the same again. And so how does Jesus answer this question in his classically non-direct way? He just lets them stick around and observe what he does for the next hour. And the text tells us that in the next hour, he healed many people from plagues and sicknesses. He freed them from the influences of evil spirits. And he even tells them not only do the blind see and the deaf hear, but the dead are raised. Now, the dead isn't raised right here in our gospel selection of verses today. But right prior to this, Jesus comes into the city and they're carrying a young man who has died out on a funeral bier. And he brings him back to life. That is what he has come to do because he is the one. His answer to them is yes. He tells them to go back to John the Baptist and tell him all the things that you have seen done here. Because John the Baptist as a prophet of God, knows what the one who is to come is supposed to be doing. And then right after it says the dead are raised, we get one of the key pieces of the promised Savior. The poor have the good news preached to them. The good news has arrived with Jesus. He is the one. Isn't it great when you ask a big question and you get a big and clear answer. Because many of you know that's not always the case with big questions. But here Jesus' answer to John is clear. I'm the one who was promised. I'm the one you were waiting for. No need to look anywhere else. And you can already see in what his disciples have observed of Jesus' actions... The world is already changing in ways that it never has before. 
You see, the purpose of Jesus, the Messiah, was to free the world and free us from the influences of sin. Have you ever noticed that all of the miracles described in the Gospels are small examples of that very thing? Jesus is freeing individuals from the effects of sin, whether it's disease, whether it's being possessed by an evil and fallen spirit, or even raising the dead. All of those are the consequences of sin, and he has come to change the world forever. And so it has begun. One of my favorite illustrations of this is from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He emphasizes that the world is not going to change until the promised one comes with the phrase that it's always winter, but never Christmas. And he made that an allusion to this biblical truth that until Christ comes into the world, this change that the promised one is to bring is on hold. We are stuck in a perpetual winter without the arrival of the promised Savior. Well, Christmas is coming. In fact, in the text today, it's already here. Jesus is the one. So after Jesus basically tells them, yes, I'm the one who is promised, go back and tell John what you have seen here, he'll know. Then as soon as they leave, he turns to the crowds and the questions continue. We've all probably been familiar with that frustrating reality that sometimes when you ask a question and you get an answer, now there are more questions. And so Jesus continues to ask the crowds questions, and these questions are a little bit more difficult to answer. These questions are because he wants the crowd to think about why they went to go listen to John the Baptist in the first place. So he starts two verses out in the same way. He says, why did you go out, or who, or what, did you go out into the wilderness to see? And then he gives two separate sort of rhetorical examples. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Now this imagery is used to, to uh, bring to mind somebody who bends and moves around in order to survive against forces that are coming towards it. So somebody who's going to just say yes and no, depending upon whether or not it's going to harm them. A yes man, if you will. And we know John the Baptist wasn't that. So Jesus is asking this rhetorical question, knowing that the answer is, you didn't go to John the Baptist because he's a reed shaken by the wind. Why did you go out? What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Now in Matthew chapter 3, it tells us a bit more about the description of John the Baptist. So let me share with you what it says. It says that he wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt. So he had a, basically a long garment made from camel's hair, cinched with a leather belt, and he ate locusts and wild honey. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A man in soft clothing. Certainly not. And why does he pick this image? Well, he goes on to say that those who are wearing the soft clothing and living in luxury are in king's courts. In other words, an earthly authority, or at least the perception of some earthly authority, is not the reason that you have gone out into the wilderness to see John the Baptist. He has no public authority, he's uncouth, he doesn't look appealing, and yet still many came. What did you go out into the wilderness to see then? And really that is an interesting question that we should ponder. Why did people go out into the wilderness to see John? Because he wasn't in a convenient place for them, they had to go to him, he's certainly not a comfortable person to be around. I mean, imagine somebody with that description walking into the back of the sanctuary right now. A garment of camel's hair with a leather belt, eating bugs and wild honey. How many of you would sit right next to him in the pew? And he's coming out from the wilderness, so he probably doesn't smell great either. 
Right? So all the things that we think would draw many people to somebody, John does not possess. And then the reed shaken by the wind. He's certainly not that. We have a sort of tongue-in-cheek award for when you graduate at the seminary, we get to vote on which one of our classmates is most likely to say brood of vipers from the pulpit first. And that comes from John the Baptist. So if you come and listen to John the Baptist, you're going to hear some things about yourself that aren't great and uncomfortable. Certainly not a reed shaken by the wind, because he doesn't just say that to unimportant people who can't do anything to him. He says that to kings who can throw him in jail and have his head chopped off. And yet he still says it. Certainly not a reed shaken by the wind. So why do people go and listen to John? What did you go out in the wilderness to see? Truth with a capital T. God's word. Remember last week that for the first time in 400 years, God's word came to John as a prophet to the people of God. Prior to this, for four centuries, there had been no word from God, and the religious leaders of the day had strayed from God's word. There was a crisis of truth in John's time. Does that sound familiar? Many would say that our time is a crisis of truth. And to be totally honest, you can probably say that about most any time. But just like now, in John's time, there was a large degree of societal mistrust. Most people knew that something wasn't being told to them that was important. And it was much more than the society that they, they lived in at that time. It was much more than governmental issues. It was much more than daily life issues. It really got at the core of why people ever began to ask the question, what are you looking for? That is a question of purpose, a question of meaning. And if you remove truth, there is no purpose and there is no meaning. So people were craving truth. They were craving meaning. They were even willing to go to the wilderness and listen to some uncouth, rude man tell them harsh truths about themselves because they wanted the truth. If you've ever been in a situation where you know somebody is lying to you and you can tell, or at least they're not telling you the whole story, it leaves you deeply unsatisfied. That's the difference between a genuine compliment and empty flattery. There's no truth behind those things. And once you've endured that for a little while, you start to want something real. So what did you go out into the wilderness to see? You went to go and see a prophet, one called by God, having received word from God to hear the truth, to hear God's word to you. And what exactly was John saying? That Jesus says, no one greater has been born of a woman? Well, we can learn some lessons from him. He's not concerned with anything in this world. John the Baptist is so unconcerned with this world that he will tell a king that he is an open and unrepentant sinner for taking his brother's wife, knowing that it's not going to end so well for him. He doesn't shy away from speaking harsh truths. Brood of vipers, repent because you are a sinner. The kingdom of heaven is coming and if you don't do that, it will not end well for you. He speaks the truth the same to everyone. Last week, we heard from soldiers and tax collectors, people scorned in Jewish society. We heard him speak to Pharisees and kings, and it was the same message to all. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's a good lesson for us as the people of God in 2021 to learn from John. That we are not called to be reeds shaken in the wind, to bend so that we survive in order to avoid speaking the truth of God's word. 
And our main concern, the things that we are waiting for, the thing we went out in the wilderness to see, is not of this world. In other words, we are not, like John, to become overly concerned with the goals and plans and visions of this life, however lofty they may be, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We now know that the word of God brings truth to all people, the same truth regardless of station, regardless of victimization, regardless of anything in between, the most beaten down and the most lifted up. They're equally sinners in need of salvation in Jesus. That same truth is preached to both. The, the truth that's not so easy to stomach, like you are a sinner, and apart from Christ, you deserve eternal damnation. But also the good and easy truth to hear, the wondrous grace and mercy of Jesus that despite that truth of being a sinner, Jesus is the one. Things are changing forever now that he is here. Bringing to you the love of God through salvation and eternal life. It also teaches us, I think, a good lesson as the church. That our external appearance will not be the reason people come to hear us. And actually, the statistics back this up. They've done numerous studies about people who have left the church and why they've stayed, and the programs, it seems, have absolutely nothing to do with it. The trappings of church, but rather the word. And I have to say also, as a pastor, one of the things I've heard most often in the last couple of years is that people want to go somewhere where the word of God is preached faithfully. They want to hear the truth, just like in John's time. They're tired of empty platitudes and flattery. They're tired of the emptiness of this world. And they're hungering and thirsting for the righteousness that God has to offer in his word through Jesus. So there's no need for us to dress up or wanting to appear on the inn of culture so that we can have some sort of perceived human authority. The only authority that we need comes from God and his word, and people will seek it out. So, what are you waiting for? What are you looking for? The answer is truth and Jesus. Is there any other reason you are here today, this morning, in this place of worship? Because if there is, that reason will not last. If you're here because you like how neat our service is, I can assure you, some days it's not neat. Some days we mess up. If you are here because the people are so nice, well, sometime in the future they and you are not going to be nice. Sorry to break it to you, but they and you are sinners in need of Jesus. If you are here to start some revolution to bring our society back on track or to the good old days, sorry, we're not really overly concerned with that here. We're concerned with Jesus. If you're here for Jesus, the one who is to come and has come, you will find him here and always. If you're here for the truth of God's word, by his grace, that is the basis of all our teaching and preaching. That is the root of any authority that you would find in this place. And here is that truth. Repent. You are a sinner. A sinner fully worthy of the eternal punishment of God. But God has promised a Savior. Jesus is that promised Savior. You heard the answer to that question in our gospel reading today. He is the one that you are waiting for. He has come to take that sin, your sin, upon himself and die the death that you deserve. He did that because he loves you. And now we are again in a position of waiting, waiting for his promised return to complete the good work that he has begun in us. And until then, 
we come to him, confess our sin. We don't turn away from the harsh truth of God's word. We receive his forgiveness and the blessed gift of the sacraments and his promises in Jesus. We rest in the grace of God, no longer under the condemnation of the law. And we hear the truth of his word until he comes again to make everything new. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now as our epistle reading stated, may the peace of God which passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as we wait for his final return to make all things new. In his name, amen.